at this time, let's begin today's CMC webinar. Once again, becoming a leader, overcome your fears. At this time, it is my pleasure to introduce your moderator for today, and that is Tanya Cervoni, Practice Leader, Leadership Development at Canadian Management Centre. She brings 20 years of experience in the areas of education, training facilitation, coaching, and organizational development. Tanya holds her BA Honors Degree in French Literature and Sociology Anthropology from the University of Guelph and a Bachelor of Education from the University of Toronto. She also has a Certificate in Adult Education from George Brown College. In her role as practice leader, Tanya combines her expertise with her commitment to enable personal transformation to discover, curate, and design learning solutions for CMC clients. With that, Tanya, I will hand the floor over to you. Thank you, Jess, and uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to today's session. We're really excited to have you here today as we talk about becoming a leader and looking at the strategies for you to overcome fears that you may have in making this significant transition. For those of you who are new to Canadian Management Centre, just to give you a little bit of background, we are a national organization dedicated to preparing the next generation of leaders to thrive in tomorrow's marketplace, and we offer a host of open enrollment programs as well as custom solutions to, uh, to achieve that end. And as we're doing today, we also deliver webinars to our clients based on requests we receive from our attendees. So for those of you who've joined us in the past, welcome back. And to those of you who are new to our webinars, uh, just so you know, we are on Twitter and you are welcome to join the conversation online. Um, you can follow us. Our handle is at Canadian Management. And we invite you to tweet any insights from today's session using the hashtag CMC events. I would also like to remind everyone that you will receive access to a recording of today's events, which will um, allow you to see the slides. And of course, you can review uh, the information at your convenience. Today, I'm really uh, pleased to welcome one of our esteemed facilitators, Janelle Van Helst. Janelle has been a Canadian Management Center facilitator since 2001. She's delivered high-impact solutions for formidable clients such as Microsoft Canada, ATI, ATI rather, Technologies, AstraZeneca, and the Bank of Montreal. Janelle leads many courses and webinars uh, within several of our portfolios, including leadership, management, communication, as well as sales. And Janelle has extensive uh, practical experience in business, both leading people and facilitating learning, uh, which complement her academic background focused on adult education and business administration. And since we have a lot of content to cover today, um, Janelle, I'm going to just turn things over to you. Thanks so much, Tanya. A pleasure and an honor to be your guide, your facilitator throughout the rest of this webinar. And with Tanya and Jessica's help, we'll hopefully make this an incredibly exciting experience, almost exciting as becoming a leader uh, itself. It is, a, it is an incredibly thrilling opportunity to become a leader and transition into a leadership role. And let's face it, it's, it's the recognition of your success and contributions to date. And so when this opportunity to become a leader makes itself available to you, it's all great, isn't it? Isn't it all fabulous? Well, yes and no. The reality is that even if we want to, even if we lead, or even if we currently lead, or even if we're looking forward to a leadership role, this transition itself can be stressful. Change in of itself is stressful. Both positive and negative changes create stress. So even though it's something we've worked hard to achieve, in other words, our leadership role, uh, for many new leaders, there is some natural anxiety uh, that can come with this transition to leadership. Fear and doubt are normal. They're normal reactions to new and unknown opportunities. The good news is not only are your emotions potentially um, uh, challenging for you and that they're normal, but there is some um, truth to being able to prepare for this transition to really kickstart your team and your confidence and your capability so as to avoid some of the potential pitfalls. Um, so again, we can fast track your leadership experience. 
you know, the one thing that I remember when I first became a leader about 30 years ago, uh, I had assumed that because I was an individual contributor that solved all the problems and answered all the questions, that my role as a leader was to continue to do the same. In other words, my employees would come to me with questions and problems, and I would say, leave it with me, and I would assume that it was my responsibility, again, to find all the answers and to solve all the problems. Well, I very quickly learned that it's my job to ensure the answers are found. It's my responsibility to ensure that the problems are solved. In other words, tapping the intelligence and the experience of my people around me to find the answers and to solve the problems. So that in of itself can help relinquish some existing um, stress or anxiety that you may be ex experiencing right now in your transition. So what I'd like to do initially is gain a little bit of insight about you. So Tanya, if you wouldn't mind walking them through our very first poll. Thanks, Janelle. Yes, we'd love to have some participation from the audience right from the get-go because we'd also like to get a better sense of who we're talking with today so we can uh, tailor our conversation your way. So uh, we invite you to take a look at the question on your screen. You should see a poll open up on the right-hand side. And we'd like to know, are you uh, an aspiring leader? an informal leader, meaning you may not hold a formal leadership or managerial title, but in some capacity you're leading people or people look to you for your leadership skills, um, or have you been leading um, in, a, in a leadership role but it's been less than a year, or have you been leading for more than a year? So if you can take a moment to select which one best describes your situation and then remember to hit the submit button in the bottom right hand side of your screen, uh, that would be great. Um, I would imagine we may have a mix of folks, even though this is speaking to people who are making that transition. Um, I think there are a lot of people who are always committed to looking for tips to overcome any fears and challenges, even if you've been at this for a couple of years. And the one that you described um, in particular, Janelle, I think, it's, I think it's probably common to almost every manager uh, if you're used to being an individual contributor and solving those problems on your own, it can, it can be challenging to see that your role is actually to enable that skill in other people. Yes, the pain and suffering I could have <laughs> saved Fared. my employees, <laughs> saved everybody around me, including myself, if I had that clear kind of approach and mindset to begin with. Um, I would have worked more efficiently, more effectively. I would have been able to fast track my credibility as a leader as well. However, uh, learning from experience is one way to learn. These webinars are another. Yeah, it's in inevitable. I mean, hopefully we'll be able to share some tips that can help prevent uh, folks having to learn the hard way, but you know, you're ultimately going to come against some things that uh, there, there are no tips for, and you're just going to figure out as we go. So and true. We're, <laughs> we're just uh, waiting for those poll results to come in now. Um, and for those of you who maybe um, have been managing for over a year, um, there are going to be some great tips that you can share for people that you might be leading who are making this transition because I think it is easy to forget uh, some of the things you do face when you first make the change. Um, you know, once you've been doing it for a while, it becomes uh, second nature and we can, we can easily forget what some of that, uh, what that experience was like. And Tanya and Janelle, those results are now up on the screen. You should see those on the right-hand side of the screen. Looks like the majority of folks at 40% are saying they are an informal leader. Okay. Um, I'm not seeing them on the screen. So we, we, uh, we have a, a majority at informal leader. Is that what you said? That's okay. I can uh, read them off to you. It says the so, uh, majority yeah. of folks. Uh, at 40 percent are uh, saying they're an informal leader. Um, after that, we have about 30 percent of folks that are saying that they have been a leader for over one year. Uh, next, at 20 percent, uh, we have folks saying that they're uh, an aspiring leader. And then finally, coming in last, at 10 percent, we have people saying that they have been a leader for less than one year. Thank you, Jessica. Well, as anticipated, we do have a spread, and the 
Um, the number of people who say they're an informal leader, and that's not surprising for a couple of reasons. I would imagine of those folks, some may be transitioning to a more formal leadership role. And as I mentioned as well, leadership really today is not limited by, you know, level within the organization. It does happen at all levels. And I think to some degree all of us, uh, regardless of title and position, are expected to demonstrate leadership and we're all having to work more collaboratively. So um, with that, I'm going to transition it back to you, to Janelle, to talk a little bit about what we're going to be talking about. Excellent. Well, let's start with some of our expected outcomes or what we'll cover today. And they're really fourfold. We uh, expect that you may have had fears or existing fears that might be holding you back from looking at a leadership position or you're just not sure. Maybe you're not sure whether you want to be a leader or not. So really being clear in regards to identifying of those fears and anxieties that might be holding you back from considering a leadership role or maybe you're early in your leadership role and again, some of the fears have conjured up doubt, et cetera. Again, normal reactions <laughs> if you have been recently promoted um, to really identify and relate to those fears so that we can manage them and we can do the best that we can to transform that energy into something that's productive for you so it's no longer holding you back. Uh, secondly, reframing your overall approach to achieving results. So as a leader, um, what is your innate style? What are the accountabilities and responsibilities of leadership today and beyond? Thirdly, we are going to um, provide you tips throughout the program but specifically, this is in regards to tips to building your own confidence and credibility as a leader. So again, fast tracking uh, your image and reputation as a leader. And then finally, reducing this anxiety in your leadership transition. And uh, that transition could be weeks, months, or years for some people, depending on their own natural reactions and experiences. So let's get into these outcomes. And that leads us to our second poll, and that is what specifically are your fears? So, Tanya, I'll hand it back to you. Thanks, Janelle. Yeah, it's important to identify and know what those fears are um, that might be holding you back from really embracing your new role. So, once again, we would, we would love to hear from you. What we've listed on the screen here, and you'll see on the poll on the right-hand side, is that um, we've got some of the top four that we hear from our clients and our participants, and they're, what if they don't like me? What if I fail? What if I don't really have the skills to succeed? And finally, what if I don't like it and, you know, I can't go back to my individual contributor role? So if you could take a moment and see which one resonates the most with you, either something that you're experiencing now or maybe just, you know, recently working through and hit submit, um, we would love to understand where you're at with this. Uh, I don't know about you, Janelle, but um, I can certainly relate to the last one. What if I don't like it, um, but I can't go back? Because, you know, I think as you said, you know, oftentimes we're, we're promoted into a management role because we're, you know, we're pretty good at being an individual contributor. And sometimes management comes as this recognition, as you said, and um, it can be really uncomfortable to not know, like, am I going to be equally as good in a role where the skills that you're going to be assessed on in terms of your performance can be quite different. So uh, yeah. that's one that really speaks to me. I don't, I don't know about you. Well, and I, and I know you, Tanya, and not having a backup plan might be incredibly um, anxiety What are you saying, you? Janelle? <laughs> Control freak? Okay, yes, I admit it. I am, totally. <laughs> Just you're an, you're an analytical person. You have to have a backup plan. For me, it was more about popularity and having to do the tough stuff. And I didn't like doing the tough stuff, like giving constructive feedback, like resetting expectations, like um, saying no, turning people down. I, I, so A really did, um, shall I say, uh, reach out to me. I should have been more fearful of C, um, that I might not really have the skills to succeed, but I guess I was, I was blind. Um, and I, I, I soon learned the skills I didn't have when I was early in my leadership role, but um, well, that fear might have it, served me well beforehand. 
Well, it looks like C is the winner um, in the sense that 46% have rated, what if I don't really have the skills to succeed? Follow closely by what if I fail? And if you really think about it, the, the two are very linked. One is just simply more specifically looking at the skills that might cause someone to fail. So um, I guess dissimilar to me, and people aren't necessarily looking to go back <laughs> to their previous role, <laughs> but they are definitely worried about failure. Uh, and the good news, of course, is that we've got some tips in, uh, in that area. So over to you, Janelle, let's continue. Thanks so much. And again, I want to conclude this piece with fears are normal. Um, doubt is normal. If you've been promoted to a leadership role, and I know that some of you have, and you think some mornings you wake up, I know you do. What was I thinking when I took this promotion? Um, if you don't think of that on occasion, I'm hoping it's not every day, if it is every day, then you need to have a very candid conversation with yourself and your boss. But if, if it's on an ad hoc basis and it's infrequent, it's on occasional um, kind of experience for you, what was I thinking? That's normal. Again, fear and emotions are normal. They're part of us. It's just a matter of transforming that energy into being something more productive for us. So let's, let's get right into that. You know, really fears being great motivators for doing some things. Um, we would love to just honor uh, George Adair's uh, quote here, that everything you've ever wanted is on the other side of fear. And don't kid yourself, you don't have courage to face fear. You earn the courage after you have move to the other side of fear. So you're earning courage as you're facing your fears, and we're going to be doing that today. So George Adair, um, he established the Omega Vector Programs. It's a self-knowledge program for those who wish to live more effective lives. And uh, George, who happened to pass away in 2012 at the age of 80, devoted his whole life to serving humanity. So really, if you need to make a change and fear is holding you back, ask yourself three pointed questions. What's the best outcome if I act? What's the worst outcome if I act? <laughs> In other words, if I take on the leadership role, what's the best outcome and what's the worst potential outcome? And then finally, number three, what's the result of inaction if I don't take the promotion or the leadership role in formal um, structure in the organization? What's the result of that? So if you can anticipate these answers, tease them out, work through them, follow your heart, your instinct, as well as your intellect to answer these questions, it can then help, help prompt you to, again, move beyond the fear and decide for yourself what's the best option for you. Because specifically in your pursuit of career development, managing your fears will help you move forward. And it's a requirement to manage your career and develop yourself in your, in your career. So let's tackle that. So how do we shift our approach and how do we ensure that we are ready to make the transition from individual contributor to new leader? Well, with some best practices and some tools and methods. And in essence, really being, being clear as to what it is to be a leader. So of course you're going to have new responsibilities um, as a leader. Uh, you're transitioning from your individual contributor role to a leadership. So uh, an individual contributor is, is responsible for doing his or her own work, answering his or her own questions, <laughs> solving his or her own uh, problems. Uh, and also, uh, an individual contributor can really stand on his own and her own skills and capabilities and confidence in that regard. Well, moving into a trend and transitioning into a leadership role. A leader must get things done with and through others, a completely different approach. So getting things done through and with others requires an entirely different set of skills than doing the task yourself. Uh, passing on the responsibility to get a job done to someone else requires that you have certain interpersonal savvy. Also learning to let go is a real um, a personal one for me, um, one of the things that you'll need to do to make time for your new roles, your new responsibilities as a leader, is that you have to let go of the tasks and those tasks that are, let's say, comfort food for you, uh, comfortable tasks, easy to do tasks, things that you can do on autopilot or in your sleep, so to speak, and have been the very things that have first got you noticed as a capable person. So for example, you're generating a report that you've done for a long time and you know how to do it and it gives you confidence and make you feel valued. Well, we tend to hold on to these tasks again because they give us the confidence and make us feel validated. But 
you need to let it go and delegate this task to someone else on the team so as to give them an opportunity to learn this new task, but also to free up time for you to focus on your new role and possibly less comfortable and more scary tasks as, as a leader. However, only when you let go of the old, easy, comfortable tasks will you really make room for the new roles and responsibilities as a leader. So, as a leader, you will also need to find a source of reward and or satisfaction for yourself. In other words, feeling, shall we say, success because the team was successful. So, it becomes less about you and what you do and more about what your team can achieve. So, again, uh, their successes are your successes. So with that overall approach in mind, let's now take a look at a quote from Jack Welch. This summarizes one of the biggest shifts you need to make as a leader. Um, the approaches that made you successful as an individual contributor are not the same as what's required when you're a leader and responsible for growing others. Uh, if you don't know about Jack Welch, he was uh, chairman and CEO of GE between 1981 and 2001. Uh, he also became an incredibly popular uh, business author and leadership expert. So, this biggest shift change you'll need to make in your approach now as a leader, you're responsible for achieving results with and through others. That means you're responsible for motivating them, for keeping them growing and developing, and generally caring and feeding of your team so they will continue to perform and deliver the results you expect. I've also seen a, a, another quote, um, you're not a leader until you've helped another leader become a leader. In other words, leaders create leaders. So let's use that to take a look at the type of leader you want to become. Sometimes when we have a clear vision of what we want, it helps to become more confident if we break it down, look at it in more digestible pieces so this overall enormity of a goal of becoming a great leader is, again, uh, more palatable and easier to understand and digest. So let's reflect on your own experiences with leaders that you've worked with. And we have a chat panel um, exercise for you. And here we'd like you to think about some great leaders. Go ahead, Tanya. No, absolutely, yes. There's a question on your screen. Again, we're going to invite you to uh, give us your thoughts, but this time using the chat panel on the right-hand side and send your response uh, to all panelists. And if you could uh, take a moment to think of a leader that you've enjoyed working with and that inspired you, you know, what were some or what are some of the skills that they excelled at? Um, you know, what did, uh, what, what did they do or say that really had you be inspired or you know, uh, respect them. So take a moment, uh, if you could share your thoughts with us, again, in the chat panel and send your response to all panelists. Um, I know for me, uh, there there's one leader in particular, her name is Debbie, and uh, probably one of the most, uh, the best leaders that, that I've um, had the opportunity to work with, particularly uh, early, when I, early in my career when I first became a manager. And I would say one of the things that, um, she did really well was recognizing what I did well and giving me opportunities to do more of that, even if that meant, you know, getting uncomfortable or especially when that meant um, getting uncomfortable. So that's uh, one of the things that, uh, that, that stands out for me. Um, I'm seeing a couple of uh, comments here in the chat panel. Um, Nicole's mentioning um, the leader she's thinking about is a good listener. Um, Eva saying, always looking for a better way of doing things. Um, we've got Phyllis saying one of the greatest leaders that she ever had uh, was her first grade teacher and set her up for success later in life. So yeah, of course, leadership comes from all places of our, of our life. That's a really great point. Um, Caroline, great communicator and follow through on promises. Um, how about you, Janelle? Is there a person that stands out in, in your mind? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm like you trying to digest all these chat answers, and my gosh, I agree with all of you. Um, but the one personal experience that, that uh, I can relate to is a leader, her name, her name was Deb as well, as well, Deborah. She got more out of me than I even thought was possible. And, and it wasn't that it was number of hours that I put into the job. It was just my in intellect and capability. She just always asked me questions, always, always, always asked me questions of what do you think? What are your options? What are your other options? What do you think would work well? What are the limitations? She was an incredible coach leader and, uh, again, learned more about myself than I even cared to know. 
um, but again, was incredibly valuable to set me up for my leadership role. And I hear that echoed by some of the uh, other comments here, like we've got Nicole saying, you know, wanted to hear my recommendations prior to offering theirs when trying to solve a problem. Uh, Derek is saying motivating, pushing you to try new things. That's exactly what my experience was. Um, gee, empathy, understanding, patient encouragement from Laura. Um, you know, listening is coming up as definitely a theme. Um, you know, they were always approachable, willing to listen. Um, oh, here, yeah, this is kind of what you were saying in terms of your transition. So we've got, uh, you know, guiding you to an answer, but not necessarily giving you the answer. Um, so some really thoughtful comments, and this is really starts to paint the picture of, you know, what great leaders do, inclusive, uh, cooperative problem solver. So we can take a lot of inspiration from this. It, it, it's it, it's incredible here. They they keep they keep coming in. One that I've noticed is I think from if I'm reading it correctly uh, from Kelly Roy. Uh, I was inspired by former Justice Arbor. She was a leader who was very courageous and not afraid to tackle very serious issues. Right, smart, visionary thinker, but still able to do things that might um, uh, promote unpopularity. And again, leadership is not a popularity mm. contest. Encourage Absolutely. me to take more responsibility from Lawrence. I mean, in incredible. Uh, if we would, these are like the ingredients of an ideal leader. And you're right, there are some patterns and trends, but um, we certainly have some good role models out there by the sounds of it. Absolutely. Fantastic responses. Thank you, everyone, for your contribution. And I'll, and I'll mention now as well that uh, we hope to have some time for Q&A at the end. So as we're going through um, in the actual Q&A panel, feel free to start putting in any questions as, as you're hearing what Janelle is, is sharing. Um, start putting in some questions there, and we'll do our best to address those when we get to the uh, Q&A uh, section. Um, but I think for the moment, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll move on. Thanks so much, Tanya. In, in essence, if we have these good, positive role models, it helps us to be able to replicate what they've done, and we can become good leaders ourselves. So when we break it all down, it seems less overwhelming. I mean, these are the, these are the competencies, the skills, the attitudes and beliefs of effective leaders. Um, so it's just a matter of being crystal clear in regards to these, shall we say, options for us to execute. So. Next, we want to explore our own natural leadership style. So of all of these great skills and capabilities that you might have seen in other leaders, you may also see in yourself. And with um, uh, these great examples of leadership abilities, uh, we can then better understand where we fit into this whole leadership role. So we all start as a leader with our own natural leadership style. So each of us has a natural preference or, or tendency to demonstrate certain actions and behaviors more so than others. So it's, it isn't to say that we can't change or evolve our style. We certainly can with purpose and, and intent and effort. But being aware of our natural preference is incredibly helpful at the start of our leadership journey. So in essence, my own natural leadership style might work best with this particular person in this kind of a situation. But I may need to, and I certainly do believe, I need to adapt my leadership style depending on the circumstance, the context, the person, et cetera. So it's part of our growth as a leader to develop different styles and to be able to toggle between them depending upon what's required of us in the situation. So as new leaders in particular, we need to be aware of this style because it is definitely going to impact how we are perceived and could also have a significant impact on our relationships with others. So that is a great place to start, is better understanding what your natural style is. And here are six leadership styles that were pulled from Daniel Goleman's work Daniel Goleman is a PhD and an internationally known psychologist. He was the, shall we say, grandfather of bringing the terms emotional intelligence into the business environment um, by identifying what leaders can do to, again, demonstrate emotional intelligence, not only um, intellect. So his work led him to write a number of books, uh, including one recent called Primal Leadership. Great read, by the way, Primal Leadership. 
Uh, he also has some Harvard Business Review articles and whatnot. And in essence, these uh, documents will give you a good summary, overview, and uh, explicit kinds of examples of each of these six leadership styles. We're going to give you like an appetizer version today. So we'll categorize these six leadership styles, but I'll review them. And I'll review them one at a time. And what I'd like you to think about is which of these six styles is probably most like you? Which of these six leadership styles may you bring into your leadership role naturally, inherently? So as we go through, you'll find that possibly two, maybe three, could be very comfortable for you to demonstrate. And it's really important for us to use that self-awareness to then jump into the adaptation of trying on the other leadership styles for size as well. Again, depending on the circumstance and the situation, the purpose, and the per person that you're speaking with, you can choose between these six styles. So I find it very empowering. I found this content very empowering when I first read it. So the first one, coercive, doesn't sound very good, does it? Coercive is really a traditional way of leading, and it was do what I tell you to do, how I tell you to do it, and it is an incredibly directive approach. Um, we do expect compliance when we're being coercive as a leader. Uh, we're the ones that, we, that, that decide. We have the autonomy and the decision-making um, power, and we keep it to ourselves. And we also have a tendency to uh, monitor closely to ensure that people are complying. So. There are some circumstances, and Daniel Goldman specifically states when to use each of these six. So I've got a bit of guidance. On the course of style, although it has an overall negative impact on climate and culture as per his research, it is appropriate in three very specific situations. You're probably already guessing them now. Um, problem employees. Now, those are Daniel Goldman's words, not my words. Um, I call them special employees, but problem employees. You've tried uh, coaching, you've tried resetting expectations, and it's really not working. You have to lead down the discipline path, the formal discipline path uh, that your organization has set out for you. So this is when to use coercive. Two other uh, situations in which coercive is the ideal style is when you have to kickstart a turnaround, a turnaround in a business, a turnaround in an organization, and to save the life of the organization. Um, things have to be done incredibly differently, swiftly. So again, to kickstart a significant turnaround. Third and finally is crisis. Now, when I say crisis, I mean real crisis, emergency, uh, fire <laughs> comes to mind. Um, in other words, it's not an impending deadline. It is truly, truly, um, we have to regroup, we have to refocus, we have to do things differently because of a crisis or an impending crisis. So coercive, again, is one of the six options. Second option is the visionary leadership style. This is the come with me style, where I'm inspiring, empowering, and using visionary terminology and language about what we could be and what we hope to be as a team, as a collective. It does very powerfully work if you're enlisting the suggestions and support of your people, if they're competent and if they're tenured. They may have some suggestions in regards to the identity of the team and what we could be when we grow up, shall we say. Um, visionary also means that when you're um, discussing your decisions, you're explaining the why, the rationale, or what led you to that particular decision or what other options you considered. So again, visionaries explain the rationale and the reasons behind a particular decision. It's also in regards to providing balanced feedback, vision, the future vision of a, per of a person's uh, behaviors and performance in the workplace. So it requires us to, again, provide balanced feedback to carve out and help foster this person's future. Two very specific circumstances um, in which using the visionary style is incredibly helpful is, uh, again, very intuitively, when changes require a new vision. So if you've been... Um, transforming in a business department or a business or a department or team or even organization. So if it's, there's been a significant transformation or shift or change in your business, you may require a new vision, which of course would be demonstrating this style. Also, just when we need a refresh on the clear direction or purpose of tasks, accountabilities, responsibilities, um, so again, explaining, articulating, discussing this direction can be incredibly helpful and again, provide people with this comfort of our future vision together. 
The next leadership style is uh, the affiliative style. It's all about the people. Can't we all just get along? It's in regards to supporting our team members and fostering them to support each other. It's being the servant leaders that we can be. Um, it's, it's this... You, it says, you, you matter to me, so I'm going to listen. I'm going to take heed of your needs, your concerns, your stressors, um, so as to create harmony and, again, making people feel valued and important. It's also really focusing on the positive, and I, I like that piece because I can see you for your potential, your positive potential, not necessarily your underperformance under, under today. So it's this ability to break free from the past of somebody's performance and see them for their potential. It's also just being completely candid and open about um, sharing of information and Again, making time for people, having that open door policy, which I saw was on, on one of the um, uh, characteristics of an effective leader. So very specifically, the affiliative style is recommended by Daniel Goleman in two situations. Number one, to heal rifts. So if there is stress, um, significant change, change fatigue for that matter, but to heal rifts and challenges between and amongst team members, you're definitely going to be demonstrating the affiliative style. Also, if there are stressful circumstances, either personal stress or professional stress in people's lives, it's really important to use this affiliative style to maintain their or rekindle their motivation during these stressful circumstances. So those are the two specific um, when to use suggestions that Daniel Goldman has for us. Next leadership style is the democratic, and it is truly a participative leadership style. What do you think? What are your options? Um, what do you think our options are? Uh, we're trying to get to consensus decision making. We're seeking approval of uh, and from others. We're really demonstrating the fact that all of our opinions matter, and equally so as at, at that. So um, we're trying to reward and involve people in decisions and the recognition thereof. We're relying, of course, though, on a competent team. So if you have a competent, skilled team, you can definitely demonstrate the democratic style um, more frequently than possibly the others. Really important to use the democratic leadership style, lastly, in regards to getting buy-in and commitment. In other words, increasing accountability for people's uh, choice and work. So, again, specific recommendations for uh, Daniel Goldman uh, to have you use this democratic style is to get input from valuable employees when you need to, shall we say, use all senses and data and information and gut intuition and instinct from others around you so you can gain uh, and get a good scan on the situation. And secondly, if you, if you really need to build buy-in, if you really need people to execute and implement a particular decision, really much more successful if they've been part of that decision-making. It also dramatically increases their feeling of accountability towards those decisions that are made. So again, if building buy-in and accountability is important to you and uh, if getting input from valuable employees uh, can aid in your decision-making and learning and understanding, then you'll probably demonstrate democratic. Taste setting is an interesting one. Like coercive, it has an overall negative impact on culture and climate. However, again, it has its appropriate place and time. Uh, pace setting is really trying to get quick results um, and, and achievements, and it's in essence, do as I do. I'm the example, and if you can't do it as well as I, well, then maybe I should be looking for some other people. Again, it has an overall negative impact on culture and climate, but it does have its place. If you have an incredibly high-performing team that's knowledgeable, and you're doing routine tasks, and they're doing routine tasks, this is an ideal uh, leadership style. So again, if you're looking for, this is the one um, situation in which Daniel Goldman suggests we use pace setting leadership style, and that's to get quick results from a motivated and competent team doing routine or, shall we say, very familiar uh, work. And you're not looking to innovate, in other words. 
Last but not least is the coaching style, and this is, you know, um, exploration, trying new and different things, um, helping people self-identify, um, helping them become more aware, shall we say. And this particular style is best to use if two things are very important to you. If um, improving performance of an employee is uh, a top priority, then the coaching style would be a great one to use. And secondly, if you want to develop long-term employees, so if you want to retain your top talent that you have, if you want to develop um, some moderate employees to become superstar employees, the coaching style is an ideal option for you to demonstrate. So with these six leadership styles, I hope that gave you a bit of an overview of which ones might sound most like you naturally. And again, here is some um, foundation that you can um, shall we say, use to help build your confidence when you're moving into your transition of your new leadership role. So, and Jan again, Janelle, I, yeah, go ahead. Uh, I'm just going to interrupt here for a moment. We have a, uh, a question that came up from uh, Patricia, uh, Patricia. She says, there's so many styles, it's a little overwhelming to a new leader or one who's still learning. How do I keep these styles straight? <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> oh, man, that's a great question, uh, Patricia. <laughs> How do you keep them straight? What has helped some of the folks that I've worked with and what's helped me is just being incredibly, shall we say, thoughtful, mindful. I'll give you a situation. So an employee comes up to me with a challenge or a problem, and before I immediately respond, I actually take about five seconds to consider, okay, which of the six leadership styles would be best? Now, I've been working with these six leadership styles for about 12 years, so they're much more familiar to me. So it doesn't take me very long to adjust and choose which of the leadership styles is going to work in a particular situation. But what I'm suggesting you do is just take those few seconds to consider, all right, what's at stake? Who is this person? Which of the six leadership styles could I use? And, and Patricia, even to make it um, more dynamic and more real for you, you could demonstrate three leadership styles in the same conversation or dialogue with somebody. So um, you can start off the conversation being democratic. Well, what do you think? and they might have an answer, and then you might move into coaching, such as, you know, are you open to some other ways of doing it? Who else could you tap into to find other ways of, of looking at this or solving the problem? Um, so it, it's incredibly organic and dynamic in action, but it has to be mindful. So what has helped me keep it straight is just I'm constantly reminding myself on a daily basis, uh, which of these leadership styles would be best considering the person and the circumstance. I hope that helps, but read the article or pull some of the books or do a Google search on some of these leadership styles and that might also help keep it top of mind. I hope Thank that you, helps, Tr Patricia. Uh, yeah, I think that was, uh, that was quite helpful. And like you said, you, you, we are really a combination of them and it, it takes a while to get familiar, but I, I'll stop interrupting you because we want to have some time left for Q&A so, and we've got a, a bit more to go. So thank you, Janelle. <laughs> You bet. And, and to close this whole leadership style piece, of course it's overwhelming because it's all new. Um, but again, the more you digest and read and review and reflect, the easier it is. And so let me close with that. I'm hoping you found uh, two or three of these that might be naturally part of you. So that should give you some confidence and jumpstart your leadership career. But you will have a tendency to over demonstrate those ones that are natural to you. So be cautious not to over demonstrate the ones that are most natural and comfortable for you. Um, uh, Daniel Goldman in the article that explains these six uh, leadership styles suggests that you use them like golf clubs. Um, you consider where your um, ball is on a particular uh, terrain, what the wind conditions are like, how far is the tee, and you choose your club or your iron based on those conditions and your environment. So he's suggesting the same thing. So using each of these six as though they were golf clubs and consciously choosing which is best for you and the circumstance. So that's a big content piece of our webinar today. Um, there are a, a couple of the smaller pieces, but equally important, um, but maybe easier to digest, and that is overall your role as a leader is <sighs> has changed over the last 50 years. And uh, now that we've explored our natural leadership style, 
um, the next step is to understand what is expected of us in this role of leadership today and beyond. Um, this is going to help us understand where our natural strengths are, uh, whether we're a good fit, uh, where we have some gaps and therefore need to invest some more development time or efforts into being the best leader possible. So understanding what is expected of us is important. You may want to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with um, your new boss, your new uh, employees, team members to better understand what they expect of you and what you expect of them. So the first piece is energize. It's our role to stay on task until that task is completed, whether it's tough and challenging and that task has, has grown and evolved and changed or whether that task is boring or tedious, really we need to let them know that the task is still important to complete and certainly encourage them and stay energized and motivated. Uh, the next piece is empowerment, giving people the autonomy to make their decisions themselves and really honestly help clear any obstacles in, in their path um, that might be preventing them from being successful. So whether it's a political or um, their perceived limitation of themselves, again, it's our opportunity to empower them and, and increase their accountability. Um, support. It's our role and responsibility to create a safe environment. We need to back people up even if they've made a mistake. Um, we need to give them the credit if they've succeeded. We need to gatekeep ideas. So if we're in, an, uh, if we're in a team meeting and somebody has an idea and somebody else dismisses the idea, it's our role to step in and say, okay, let's pause here. Let's further explore this idea. All ideas are valid and, option, and, and are options. So again, we need to gatekeep ideas as they're solicited to, again, keep an open environment. And lastly, open environment of communication. Communication should really be two-way. I know that in our electronic age, it's really easy to get sucked up into the vortex of one-way email communication. So we have to do everything we can to keep the flow of information going and back and forth two-way so that your team has the information they need to get their work done effectively. We need to communicate the team's vision, the charter, the priorities, and the ever-changing priorities and roles and responsibilities of us as a team. So incredibly evolutionary uh, because 40 years ago, these, um, shall we say, roles of a leader were very different. They were to direct and control, and now we're really, again, using what we can to work through and with others and to really tap their intelligence as best as possible. So our last little piece before we get into the Q&A is developing your own, shall we say, leadership credibility. And my suggestion based on my 28 years experience as a leader is that your leadership credibility is not in your eyes. <laughs> your leadership credibility, the amount of leadership credibility you have and possess is in the eyes of the beholder. So your leadership credibility is dependent upon how others perceive you as a leader. So in essence, we need to build credibility by demonstrating confidence, but not arrogance. In other words, we have to demonstrate confidence, but we have to be able, be able to big, be big enough to admit our mistakes, admit when we've made um, a bad decision. Um, so again, being confident as well as vulnerable, showing competence, showing that we have some strength and skill and capability, but not answering all the questions for them. A real interesting dichotomy with each of these uh, two, first two bullet points. And finally, caring for others. Uh, you care about them because they directly impact the team's success and capability. So are we making time to demonstrate that we do care for others? Do we make time for others? Um, do we have regular one-on-ones and, and conversations with folks? Do we have constructive feedback as well as positive feedback uh, conversations with people? So again, fast-tracking your leadership um, credibility can certainly help you overcome some of the most significant challenges and pitfalls that a lot of leaders might be trapped into. One particular trap I'd like to honor right now is managing former peers. Here's a, a, a real difficulty for a lot of leaders today, and that is they've moved from peer to peer to peer to manager. And you'll think your people have changed. Your people will think that you've changed, but neither of you have really changed. The environment has changed. The circumstances are different. The roles and responsibilities are different. Thus, your relationships should be different. Sitting down, having a candid one-on-one -on -one conversation to discuss what each of you will stop or start doing. Uh, for example, I had to have these conversations with people. You're going to notice a difference in me. You're going to notice that I'm not going to be speaking badly or negatively about 
senior leaders' decisions, <laughs> which of course I felt quite, quite comfortable doing when I was their peer. Now that I'm their boss, I have to stop doing that. So having these one-on-one -on -one conversations with your direct reports or your friendlies, shall we say, uh, and determining what you're going to stop doing and what you're going to start doing. Also, giving uh, my friendlies, the people that used to be my peers and buddies, I really rely upon them to give me honest, candid, constructive feedback without any repercussions to them. So we can tap into those peers and buddies, but we do have to evolve our relationships with them. So that leads us, Tanya, to our uh, Q&A session, which uh, can start now. We have uh, a, a few minutes to invest in some of the primary questions that you might have. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, we have a couple of minutes. So again, uh, for all of you um, on the line, uh, we welcome your questions. So in the UCC Q&A panel on the right side, um, and enter your questions now. Um, we'd love to hear from you. Um, there were some questions that uh, that came in here along the way. Um, I've got a question here from Kate, and it's, uh, how do I say no to my boss? So <laughs> I'm thinking, you know, especially as you become a new manager, and now you're, you're sandwiched, right? You have uh, yeah. things your employees are asking, things your boss are asking, the two are not necessarily aligned, and guess who gets to mediate that conversation? <laughs> okay, so my, my short answer is very carefully. You, so you say no to your boss very carefully, but very strategically and consciously. So more specifically, aside from that vague guidance, I mean, you have to know your boss's top priorities and, and, and really be able to know about his or her job and function, what keeps him or her up at night. You really need to be on the same page with your boss. You need to know what his or her role is, so that when you are saying no, you're using it with context and you're using um, this insight into your boss's life to either justify or qualify or discuss the risks of his or her request on his or her priorities or the negative impact it might have on the team. So it's all about how the request will potentially negatively impact your boss, the team, and the organization. So it's not a selfish mm -hmm. thing. It's actually very selfless. You're saying great. no because of these other reasons. Yeah, that's great. Um, I, I see some other questions here coming in. We'll try to get a couple more. Um, oh, here's an interesting one. Uh, Melvina asks, I'm currently managing a highly qualified team made of judges, directors, and other high professional staff. What type of leadership style might be best to combine to produce best mm -hmm. results? They also perform routine tasks in a stressful environment. Ooh, that's a loaded question. Is it ever? Um... I've done a lot of work with um, people who have very high positional power, not only senior leaders in organizations, but also physicians um, in the healthcare industry and sector. Um, so I, 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 I kind of can relate to your question. Wow, your answers are going to come from yourself, okay? So I'll give you my answer, but really your answer is probably going to be better for you because what would work for me is not necessarily what's going to work for you. Um, I would still go back to the six leadership styles, and I know that sounds very uh, trite, but um, every individual and every circumstance deserves its uh, unique attention and strategic mindfulness. Um, so there isn't necessarily a pat answer as to which leadership style would be, be would be best in that kind of an environment because I really see all six may potentially apply. Uh, possibly taking off pace setting. I don't think pace setting might be uh, incredibly helpful and I would suggest use coercive with caution and use it incredibly judiciously, especially considering your, your, um, your audience, your, uh, your team members. So the other four are completely open uh, with no restrictions. I'd, I'd strongly recommend using the other four and toggling between them. Thank you. Um, we have a question here as well. Uh, how, Martin asks, how do I discipline someone who used to be my peer? Um, with courage. With sensitivity, <laughs> <laughs> you're, you, you, it's, it's tough, right? Um, it's not fun. It also depends on what your fear is in regards to what might prevent you from giving this person constructive feedback. So if I make some assumptions here, which I don't like to do, um, what might be holding you back is A, you're not sure how the person will react or respond. B, they might throw it back in your face and counterattack. I mean, there might be some different kinds of reactions that you're anticipating. So A, anticipate what their reaction would be and then tease out. What if I don't give them constructive feedback? What's the, um, what, what's the natural 
general ripple effect if I don't? Um, what if I do give them constructive feedback and it doesn't go well? How, how bad could it be? And again, um, if I do give them constructive feedback, what's the potential positive impact? So I'm going back to those three questions from um, earlier today, and that can really help you then decide whether you should give them constructive feedback or, or, or not. Uh, to this day, I still lose some sleep before giving um, some really tough constructive feedback to peers and associates and employees that I uh, incredibly respect. So you're not alone. Just be really conscious in regards to what will inaction mean and what will action mean to you. Great. And, uh, you know, I'd love to take all of these questions. Maybe we can squeeze one last one in here. I'm, I'm seeing a question from Eva. She says, I report to my controller who, in the end of the day, has the final say. I have a team of four reporting to me. Most of the time when they come to me with a question, I give them the answer, but find myself always saying, but go check with the controller just in case. Um, mm -hmm. I'm assuming here, um, it, it's, and then she follows up with, does that mean I'm a bad leader or my controller is too controlling? Um, I'm thinking there may be a, a conversation required here between herself and the controller as to what level of authority you know, they need to share or how they want to answer that because I would imagine that could be quite, first of all, undermines her authority and then it can be quite confusing to the employee um, in, yeah, in terms of how to, how to manage that. Like who is the boss here? Yeah. Uh, you know what, it's, uh, honestly, it's so much easier for Tanya and I to solve all your problems for you because we're objective, right? We're completely disconnected from your reality. So it's really easy to hear advice, and of course it's free advice, uh, but again, you have to explore internally what the ramifications are, what the implications are. But I, I intuitively agree with, with Tanya based on my experience, not only my gut instinct, but um, is there a way, and I know that I have worked with some other uh, financial organizations and controllers as well. Um, and is there a way to delineate or differentiate between roles and responsibilities or come up with some case studies in regards to, okay, this is when you can make the decision yourself, this is when you need my approval, and this is when we need the controller's approval. Is there a way or a systematic process to document some of the things that have been happening the, that have happened in the past that have been, you know, these are the questions and these are the answers. Is there a repository that you could create to have this kind of guidance for people to use as um, a resource to go to before they even come to you and before they even go to the controller? So is there, is there a way of delineating um, roles and responsibilities and trying to look at past history to help guide future decisions? So those would be my two pieces of, of, of advice. Thanks. Well, and uh, definitely uh, uh, we'll need to just uh, wrap things up. We want to end uh, on time for our folks. So we've got just a couple tips here to run through quickly, and, um, and then we've got some exciting other things to share. So I'm going to just forward it along here. Thank you, Tanya. And... So in terms of just wrapping up some of the thoughts here, really our final tips uh, today are just to remember to uh, let go, let go of those tasks that, um, that you can be uh, delegating to others. Recognize that you can't please everyone. Um, aim to earn that influence and credibility. Uh, really important not to be critical of previous ways of doing things. That's a, that's a fast road to um, d destroying credibility and trust. And, you know, ha expect that things will change for yourself and for others. Um, of course, we can't answer all of the things that we'd love to speak to today. Um, so for that reason, we do want to ask you a couple of things. Number one is what other webinar topics might you be interested in? Uh, we would love to hear from you. So feel free to enter uh, in the chat panel. Any thoughts, because this is where we get our topics from, understanding what our, uh, what our participants would like to learn more about. And of course, we do have um, related uh, courses that you may be interested in checking out. We encourage you to, uh, to check out our website um, to see the courses that we have that relate to preparing for leadership and for management, whether you're a new manager, informal manager, or someone who's been doing it for some time. Finally, for those of you uh, today who um, who are looking to earn a PDU, Canadian Management Center is a global registered education provider with PMI. 
So uh, copy down the information on the screen so that you can claim one PDU if you are looking to, um, to earn your accreditation. And again, um, we want to uh, point out that we do have not only webinars but other events. So check out our website at cmcoutperform.com. And with that, I'd really like to uh, thank you again, Janelle, for leading us through you know, a very interesting and lively discussion. Uh, and thanks to all of you that are participating today. Uh, if you'd like to learn more about CMC um, and what we offer, again, please check out our website. And we will be sending this uh, recorded session your way. And that really concludes our, our session. Thank you for being here. And we really look forward to meeting you again in a future session. Thanks so much.